Okay. Yes. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our conference at Columbia Law School, Threatened Island Nations, Legal Implications of Rising Seas and a Changing Climate. Uh, this morning's panel uh, is going to discuss migration and resettlement issues. Moderating the panel will be Professor John Van Dyke of the Law School of the University of Hawaii. Thank you, Michael. It's a great uh, honor to be part of this panel this morning. I uh, teach at the University of Hawaii and have, have had the uh, special privilege of doing some projects in the Marshall Islands. And uh, so I'm deeply aware of the um, importance of, of this meeting and, and the um, uh, importance of trying to get new ideas uh, uh, in circulation so that we can figure out how to address the very challenging um, situation facing the Marshalls and other atoll countries. The um, full bios of our distinguished panel are uh, in the materials you have, so I won't be giving them an extensive int introduction, um, but they all come with uh, deep knowledge of the topics we're going to be talking about today, and, and we're going to start with uh, um, Brad Blitz, who's a professor of human and political geography at Kingston University in London. Just on this view. Yeah. Sorry. I'll take it. Sorry. I was listening. Oh, there. Good morning. I'd like to start by reflecting on something that we heard uh, yesterday during the excellent panel discussions. And that is, it seems to me that we've overlooked one central question. Um, and this is particularly relevant when we talk about the context of resettlement or relocation. And that is the question, why do people migrate? Um, this is a favorite exam question of mine. And uh, I'm not going to give away all the answers. Uh, but I will say, it seems at first Side, it seems rather counterintuitive to us that many of the threatened islanders of concern to us are not keen on resettlement, even though to the outsider it looks like they face an existential threat. So let me offer some, some answers as to why people migrate, what we know about migration, and <clears throat> set this out as a way of informing our discussion on resettlement. First, we know that migration is a complex process. It is the product of personal and increasingly collective decisions, often decisions that are made at a household level. And <clears throat> given that, we cannot therefore second guess why people would or would not necessarily wish to relocate. Anticipated responses to environmental hazards and disasters must therefore be informed by evidence of personal motivations for migration. And to shake things up a little, I would add that we need to know from the islanders themselves, not necessarily their governmental representatives, what factors actually influence their decisions to migrate, relocate, or resettle. Second, there's a substantial body of writing which records that people's decisions are often based on partial information, uh, information which is really not sufficient to evaluate conditions in the receiving context. So people make decisions based on their ideas of their expected income. They make it based on what they think they'll get in terms of a better living standard uh, and equally in terms of reduced threat. And <clears throat> this helps to explain why, again, it may seem counterintuitive, but why is it that people will leave situations of poverty only to migrate of sites of unemployment, major unemployment, or why we see millions of people every year who leave villages around the world only to take their chances in urban slums. So that is to say that migration decisions are based on projected outcomes, and migrants sometimes get it wrong. 
Third, and this point came to me, and here's an admission, it came to me during my discussion with Robin yesterday about uh, why, why it was that um, Native peoples in Alaska were not keen on resettlement. And that is that we evaluate the risks and anticipate dangers differently and very much based on our resources and perceptions of the threat. This came to me um, really when we were discussing my own experiences having narrowly escaped a Category 4 hurricane in Jamaica. And in spite of this experience, the Blitz family still chooses to holiday every year during hurricane season on the east coast of Florida. Um, again, how we anticipate and evaluate threats depends really um, based on how we feel we can withstand any potential um, disturbance. Fourth, if we consider the experience of environmental displacement in other regions, such as South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, where, as we heard yesterday, and we heard from some of the interventions of colleagues from, from Bangladesh, um, there are significant environmental concerns there. They are certainly important as we evaluate, again, the decisions that people make to migrate. It is very clear that it is livelihoods, above all, that prompt people to migrate. Um, and in this context, livelihoods, of course, relates to issues of land, land ownership, and um, basis for one's economic survival. So all of this is to say that people don't just leave because there's a great danger. They don't just leave because they're told that the sea level is rising. There has to be a trigger. And we need to understand these triggers if we are to provide assistance, either in the form of mitigation or adaptation, including resettlement. Now, my aim in this presentation is to consider the ways in which we can advance the case for greater protection. The argument I will develop is an instrumental one, and I will say at the outset that I'm not a lawyer. I work very closely with lawyers. I have great respect for lawyers. Uh, equally, I often see lawyers as technical assistants, people who can help us get to where we need to, to get to. And I think that there are ways in which we can mobilize existing instruments and call attention to the needs of populations in peril. Uh, one way in which I think we can do so, and I'm going to discuss this in greater detail, is how we can draw upon the idea of de facto statelessness. That is, where one does not have an effective nationality, and that we can use this, among others, as a hook to advance a protection-centered agenda. Now, let me raise one further problem which I believe has contributed to the frustration that we heard yesterday and above all the recognition that, um, that was pointed out by some of the panelists who've been working on this topic for more than 20 years and yet we are still talking. Um, one problem I see which has developed, uh, which has hindered rather the development of an informed agenda for protection is that there are competing groups of scholars, UN agencies and other communities that remain disconnected from each other. More than 20 years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated that the greatest single impact of climate change could be on human migration. The panel described the prospect of millions of people displaced and outlined many of the forces that we heard yesterday, uh, problems of coastal erosion, flooding, drought. It also highlighted the dangers of soil erosion, uh, pollution, and overall deterioration of agricultural lands. Now, since then, there has, of course, been increasing acceptance that both dramatic and cumulative changes in climatic patterns present a major challenge to the security of millions of people across the developing world, and that this may, in turn, give rise to unprecedented levels of migration. Yet, in spite of this growing consensus, there is very little, and there has, to date, been very little focus on resettlement, nor, indeed, on the ways in which migration should be managed. Arguably, people seem to have been taken out of the picture. Now, recent studies which have linked climate change to migration have so far failed to reach agreement on the ways in which environmental and demographic challenges should be addressed. Climate change, migration, and development are often discussed within separate international fora. And some of you may know that there's a major international conference on climate change and displacement that will be taking place in Norway in just over a week. And it is dominated 
by the main um, humanitarian protection organizations, including UNHCR. And at first glance, I could only identify one panelist from this conference who is attending. It does seem to have been set up really quite independently. My point is that climate change has not been mainstreamed in migration policies, nor on discourses on protection. There are, however, ways of building bridges. And one way, as I will suggest, is to mobilize the label of statelessness and to use this as a way to throw open the doors uh, to UNHCR and seek alternative protection mechanisms. That said, I recognize that both the term statelessness and indeed the concept of resettlement are highly controversial. Um, first of all, the meaning of de facto statelessness is far from clear. It's subject to considerable debate, uh, both within the emerging literature and uh, within UNHCR itself. And if we consider here the 2010 Prato conclusions, Prato being the site of a major conference of international legal scholars who are working on statelessness, you see that this definition uh, is not especially helpful. It's a definition which seems to draw from aspects of the Refugee Convention. Um, it's, it includes territorial uh, restrictions. And it doesn't really uh, help us to understand how this might apply to the people of concern to us. Second, we need to, sorry, we need to recognize that resettlement is also controversial. It's controversial because it prioritizes the role of the receiving state. And since 9-11, the number of people resettled, um, certainly the number of people resettled by UNHCR has fallen considerably. Resettlement is an extremely unpopular solution to protection problems. And it, in the context of environmental displacement, it has received very little attention except in situations of involuntary resettlement where we are talking about people who are displaced as a result of uh, large infrastructure, uh, hydroelectric damming, um, and, and military installation projects, um, especially in places such as China, Vietnam, elsewhere in, in Asia, both in South and North Asia. But even if resettlement is the option of the last resort, it is crucially important to discussions around climate change, and it serves as a glaring reminder that while the policy discourse is concentrated at the global and transnational levels, as we heard yesterday from Mary Elena Carr and from personal accounts of our colleagues, climate change disproportionately affects poor developing states, which are already struggling. I'm going to... Um, jump forward to the legal basis for protection. Um, we don't have much guidance on, on resettlement. Um, there are very few places to turn to. Um, the first, most obvious place is the Refugee Convention, even though I'm aware that it does not apply to the people that we're talking about today. It is simply that there is very little information on conditions under which resettlement can be offered. Um, so those displaced by environmental factors are not covered by the Refugee Convention. And there's been considerable uh, resistance to include such people. <coughs> that said, the uh, Convention and some of the materials produced by UNHCR on resettlement do offer us some information that may inform other situations. So we understand that resettlement is described as the selection and transfer of refugees, in particular from a state, to a third state which has agreed to admit them. As I mentioned, uh, resettlement is still the least preferred option. The, the preferred option in the context of refugees is, is repatriation. Um, but the decision is made normally when there are no other options available. Further, the UNHCR handbook um, stipulates that resettlement must be made on the basis of the difference, if any, that this option makes to address immediate and long-term protection problems. And it makes clear that resettlement relies on the goodwill of states and that, of course, no state is legally required to accept them. But there are ways in which resettlement um, can be offered 
And there are ways in which we can look at this without necessarily having recourse to the term refugee. There are ways in which we can extend the definition. And certainly the U.S. is uh, really quite informative in this context. We note that, for example, under Section B of the Immigration and Nationality Act, the U.S. can recognize persons as refugees who are still in their country of origin. And there are special uh, provisions for establishing <coughs> presumptive claims to refugee status. Um, by uh, deploying a, a, a much, employing a much wider notion of, of who is a refugee, the U.S. has been able to resettle those facing acute vulnerability, and this is equally a concept that might be, might be mobilized. There are, of course, other places to look within existing international law. Um, climate change affects the full spectrum of rights, of civil, cultural, economic, and political rights. Um, others have uh, suggested that we can recast territorial attachment as the primary basis for um, international protection. And in that context, we can look at what statelessness has to offer us here. Now, the statelessness conventions have not been ratified by many countries. Um, the only one in Asia to have ratified the uh, 1954 convention is, in fact, Korea. But recently, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees has evoked the term de facto statelessness to describe uh, protection needs of populations in the Maldives and Vanuatu. And the importance is here is that even if UNHCR is reluctant to engage in the resettlement of refugees, the term expands upon protection claims, and it potentially draws populations of the uh, islands of concern to us within UNHCR's remit for stateless people. And this is a remit which has grown considerably over the last, um, I would say, three years. The budget has, um, has more than tripled. Um, moreover, it's informative to look at statelessness because this was a term that was taboo for many decades. And in fact, when I started working on this theme, I was directed to um, the book by Paul Weiss from 1979. There had been very, very little work on this for, for several decades. Since then, however, there have been multiple conferences on this theme. We've seen uh, considerable work by some of the um, convention committees on this theme. We've seen that it's been brought in on the back of other, um, other provisions and concerns for example, around uh, non-discrimination and arguably the um, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. So those are some of the legal options. Equally, I think it's helpful if we very quickly um, identify what has been done by people outside, um, outside the confines of New York, Geneva, and, and elsewhere. And I know some of you were fortunate to see the, the films that were shown last night. I wasn't, but I would just like to highlight two examples where there's been uh, really very promising evidence of community action and leadership, which has been used to, um, to plan for uh, resettlement. Again, this is, this is on a voluntary basis. And the first place is the um, Carteret Islands. Uh, a place which is uh, at risk of some of the dangers that we, we described above, but where the, uh, the Council of Elders has mobilized to um, set up a nonprofit association, an association that Robin has had some dealings with, uh, Tulele Pesa, which supports the voluntary relocation of some 6,000 inhabitants um, to the neighboring atolls and to the larger island of Bougainville. And it's head by a uh, dynamic former Oxfam employee who has received considerable support from the Catholic Church and from other agencies to put forward a step program of, of relocation. Um, they've identified places where they could purchase land. They've worked with the, both the, 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 the local communities and their own tribal communities to construct alternative housing and develop income generating projects. And this is, by all accounts, uh, a very promising example where people have taken the situation into their own hands and uh, sought to plan for their own future. Um, I will go very quickly past Tuvalu and Kiribati only in as far as I, I know I don't have time, but the one potential option here is the use of labor migration schemes as a way of um, increasing migration flows and, and 
hopefully greater claims for, for protection. I recognize that we're talking about different categories of migrant here, and these are very few young, uh, young people who have been um, able to benefit from these labor migration schemes. But this is also held as, as something to consider for the future, that if one can increase the flow of immigration, then there's more likely a stronger chance that one can work to ad advocate for greater protection. The other uh, place on the map is the Maldives, where we see a very energetic uh, political leader who has held cabinet meetings underwater, who has called the world's attention to the Maldives. And of course, this is also a country which has progressed now to middle income status. And um, the Maldives has developed a national adaptation program. We see that there are moves to uh, reconcentrate populations on larger atolls and to use the basis of tourism and development and income raised uh, in that way in order to advance a, um, a national program which is very much spearheaded by a, a creative leader. So what are the ways forward? I very quickly mentioned some examples of self-reliance and how uh, national, local, communal resources may be mobilized. There are other examples. I would have liked to have had more time to go into it. Uh, some of them were mentioned yesterday. But equally, we can look at Montserrat, where uh, the island was devastated and there's been massive internal relocation um, to a concentrated area. But nonetheless, the territory has been protected and preserved. Um, equally, in Tibet, we have the situation where we have a diaspora which has, we have a, a diaspora which is now based in, in, in northern India and yet is looking at creative ways in which to preserve their cultural attachment while the land is occupied uh, as a way of um, still strengthening their communal sense of identity in the hope that there may be some eventual return. Certainly, we can look at UNHCR as a site for potential advocacy. Um, donor support will be critical in the event that voluntary resettlement initiatives are put together. Uh, this is, this is a, a multi-stage process, and I think that perhaps starting with the statelessness conventions and equally looking at alternative mechanisms is, is one way in which we can start that ball rolling. Um, finally, I'd like to add that I think that what we really need to do is find a way to disaggregate state and rights-based foundations for the protection of both individual and group rights. There must be ways in which we can do so by drawing upon existing international humanitarian law. Equally, we need to explore more communitarian models of authority as a way in which we can re-envision the, the move from state to a larger diaspora to potentially resettled peoples. Uh, with that in mind, we need to ensure that there are ways of imparting information to islanders so that they know their rights, that advocacy is informed on the basis of evidence, that we, we know what are the triggers that would prompt people to opt for resettlement. And then we need to look at the way in which resettlement can be done in a staged way to minimize not only the anxiety that, associate, that is associated with it, but to address some of the um, cultural and psychosocial issues that we heard yesterday. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad, for that uh, excellent uh, overview of some of the challenges that we face. Our next speaker is Leslie Stein, who's a visiting scholar at the Center for Climate Change Law here at Columbia Law School. using an old version of PowerPoint. It's not my fault. <clears throat> in, <clears throat> I want to start off by saying in the full light of the eloquent comments by the distinguished island ambassadors that the link between 
land in person is indelible and that moving is not contemplated at all. I've been set with the contrary task of asking that bad what if question. If there had to be migration to another country, this had to happen, can this link between people and culture, which was explained, be maintained in the host country? <clears throat> I want to try to answer this as a practical solution. Uh, I don't want to talk about theoretical possibilities in terms of uh, various ways in which it might happen, because it's a daunting real issue. Because to speak of resettlement, if I can at all, is the resettlement of a massive group of persons to an alien country. When I say massive, for instance, with the Marshallese, it's 30,000 homes. For the Mauritians, it's half a million homes. If this is to occur or even contemplated by any host country, such as the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, one has to ask what domestic law, national or state law, does a country have that can accommodate such a massive group? I want to start with one legal layer of the question before I get to the practical solution. <clears throat> if a host country decides to accept such a group, are there any international law requirements for a host country in this regard? And secondly, how can it be done? Okay, I'm on the track. In answering these questions, I had to make these assumptions. It could be, in fact, as the recent movement of Marshallese to work in Springfield, Arkansas suggests, it might not be necessary to formulate a plan for resettlement of an englobo group, because if individuals don't move as a group, but in small numbers over time, no domestic laws are needed for their resettlement, as this will be, they will be absorbed traditionally as immigrants. It's easier, in fact, for every government to think that way. For instance, Canada gave special status to Haitians for what they called expedited individual migration. But when this occurred, aside from the welfare services that were made available, there was no special housing provided, no special services. They were left to fit in mainly into the 140,000 other Haitians already in Montreal. So this paper and presentation are in relation to a different scenario. It's concerned with the movement of a group on a large scale at once or over time, one way to a host country because of the displacement by climate change and also the willingness of the host country to accommodate them as a group. The obligation of a host country in international law as Brad just explained, is rather unclear. There's an international law obligation to provide adequate housing for refugees. These are all, however, based on the traditional notion of refugees that they'll be there for a short time and then return. It's not tailored, nor is it proposed to be tailored for those persons displaced by climate change. As well, it's not really clear what adequate housing entails. One document said in passing it should be of a local standard. <clears throat> Others have talked about the dimensions of privacy and self-respect. But these international laws have not been brought up as issues, not been clarified by any court that I know of in the world as to what actually it means in terms of practical application. In recent years also, as Brad pointed out, there's been a human rights dimension for adequate housing. It somehow elevated the whole question of what is adequate housing to a higher level. It appears to require more than just a obligation to provide some sort of housing, but to provide housing or provide more than a tent city, but to provide housing with a higher duty which respects the human rights dimension of those displaced by environmental problems. It's not possible, I would think now, for a host country that would be willing to accept those persons displaced by climate change to actually provide substandard housing because of the human rights dimension. Now, in the psychological, social, and economic studies of migration, it's clear that 
successful migration occurs when there is a development of what's called social capital, as that term is used, in, in a new country. It's defined as all factors that promote social coherence and integration, such as friendship, kinship, marriage, and the social support of the group. The anthropologist Peter Lozius says this, quote, it is, I argue, their characteristics as social capitalists which assist significantly in the issue of their longer-term adjustment, and government policies which ignore or disrupt <coughs> such processes inflict additional penalties upon them. So for there to be any plan by a host country for hosting a group of displaced persons, it must somehow create some sense of coherence and provide social support and also a connection with the land in a way that the cultural patterns that are inherent in the previous country are recognized. The question is, how can this possibly occur by any Western form of legislation as we know it? And the answer is, well, it can't. There's no connection that exists between the ability to obtain social capital and any existing regulatory framework. We never think of the ability of regulatory schemes ourselves to deliver social values. They are somehow absorbed in our Western laws. For instance, the uh, ABC liquor licensing laws of New York. They contain all our social values, not explicitly, that have to do with the sale and consumption of liquor, what we believe about it. <clears throat> However, there is no such domestic law that can accommodate the social and cultural aspirations of a new group. There's no regulatory scheme that starts from the need to produce social capital. There is, however, one that will suit and will suit quite well. Because of the developments recently in urban form and urban planning, land use regulation becomes a very good candidate for this role. It, in fact, it's the best candidate for a regulatory scheme to provide social capital. And it takes place in the form of what's called new urbanism. Now, for prior to new urbanism, for decades, since the growth of urban decay in the 80s, we've abandoned land use planning as a relevant lever to produce any kind of social consequences. Now the link between social planning and land use is back, and for the foreseeable future, it's back in the form of new urbanism. It uses new urbanism, land use pattern patterning, urban form, to foster a sense of community and create social capital by a process of understanding the social go goals and aspirations of those who are going to live in that area and imposing physical designs to accomplish these goals. It also has its own regulatory form. New ur urbanism is a concept and a method that's appearing everywhere. For instance, in New York, it's in the Smart Growth Infrastructure Policy Act. It can be seen in the state transportation policy. And it's used internationally and nationally to assess grants and new development. What it's based on is, the essence of it is that Community social capital is fostered by walkable communities of mixed uses, shops, meeting places, and the like, creating what are called in different places urban villages, pedestrian pockets, traditional neighborhood design. The idea is that most things that are in reach in a quarter of a mile or just over a thousand feet encourage a sense of community. For those of you who remember, it's a legacy of Jane Jacobs that you must have mixed use in individual interaction to create a sense of social coherence. The concept appears really to all projects that bring people together, even such as the High Line that we have in New York or the clustering new development on transportation routes known as uh, transport-oriented design. Each of these neighborhoods serve about 750 to 1,000 dwellings. The density, that's the density which is necessary to support some retail. Shops are about 1,500 square feet. Individual neighborhoods are clustered to form small towns supporting maybe 15,000 to 30,000 people in about six to nine neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are well-defined with Main Street shopping, 
even so far as to say two supermarkets per neighborhood with commercial and recreational and civic facilities. Around that forms a green network, which are connected the, uh, connects the area with other town catchments, but not within the town itself. There are hundreds of examples of new urbanism, but it also has its critics. Its critics say it imposes a single view of what development is like, fueled by nostalgia for a lost way of life. And its greatest condemnation, uh, condemnation is that the movie The Truman Show was filmed at a new urbanist project, the Seaside Florida. But it offers itself as relevant for this discussion as a candidate for domestic laws to accommodate a population of climate change displaced persons, primarily as a philosophy, as well as a process that can be converted to the whole, uh, to a regulatory form. Its candidature can be understood a bit better this way. There are four aspects to the process. The fundamental starting point is to understand, and this is what makes it suitable, that as much as possible, the cultural aspirations of the group displaced must be understood. What are, in fact, the essential elements for current social interactions? What's the social hierarchy? How is that maintained? What are the actual cultural markers? And this is accomplished through a design charrette that's a universal system <clears throat> of gathering people together to see what are their goals. It's a process used for new urbanist projects around the world. It's not simply a question asking in the abstract, what are your goals? It's fed from analysis of the existing urban structures in the, host, in the previous country, previous place, the so-called urban morphology, that reveals itself as uh, in a built form, which is the primary marker of social space and interaction. And what happens then is various scenarios are presented for testing. Local and town scenarios are set out in terms of interactions, community form, hierarchy, use of common land, retail uses, recreational uses, and civic needs. The testing and retesting then leads to new scenarios and alternative options until there is somehow a narrowing of the gap between social goals, community structure, and physical design. These goals then lead to a form of community structure based on the existing urban morphology and expressed as goals and aspirations from the charrette. How much open space is necessary? What are the housing types proposed? How do they relate to those in the country of origin? What's the design for interaction? As an example, new urbanist principles were used in Haiti. This is an example of the translation of the goals of the inhabitants of Port-au-Prince as to the structural form of the community upon rebuilding and resettlement. Forms of housing were proposed that were representations of the form of housing that was lost, and the spacing and agricultural needs were all accommodated in this design. These are rural villages bounded together by common courtyards using a new form of prefab housing that was designed to be resistant to hurricanes and earthquakes. Andreas Duaney, the founder of New Urbanism, who created this structure, said that he wanted to find out the sociology, as he put it, how the people eat, the climate they used to, the way they obtain privacy. And as examples of this, The designs initially had a living room until they realized that in Haiti, every square inch of internal space was used for sleeping. And all the interactions took place on the veranda or balcony. All the cooking took place there. But people actually took their food inside because they didn't want those who, in adjoining areas who didn't have food to actually be envious. They also found they didn't want windows that were open because of bugs, theft, and as he puts it, because of prevalent spirits. Bathrooms did not have flushing traditionally. If you notice here, the windows in that uh, drawing were able to be closed shut because of that. Bathrooms did not have flushing traditionally as they were always outside, so that had to be accommodated. Each design, as he puts it, each scenario catalyzed responses that yielded new designs 
and new scenarios. The next step is to turn that into a, the basic new urbanism principles in terms of uh, interaction between people and a sense of community, and then into a regulatory form, which is a set of standards in a local ordinance that is a result of building design that has included a specific range of building types that we're used to, such as setback and height. The result is what's called a smart code, which is a land use ordinance that places the specific forms in specific places to give form and quality to the cultural goals and aspirations of those who are going to live there. Now, this is just not my idea. The LEED ND is a system for measuring all the new urbanist principles and is now the primary system used by HUD to evaluate federal grant proposals and is a checklist of the precision that makes sure all these elements are translated. Now, this is not a New York, this is not a uh, US or even a Western idea of how it works. It's been used in, for instance, Guatemala. Uh, it's been used in various places in Saudi Arabia. And it's been used in India as well. These are just some examples of hundreds where the new urbanist principles have been used to translate. My conclusions are that at the moment there are no domestic laws as a matter of practicality that can handle any influx of migrants in a cohesive group to a new country that have different cultural or social values. There are no laws in the locker for housing and for accepting the cultural and social needs of those coming. It is the case that social cohesion might occur if they stay together, as have Cuban refugees in Miami. But the problem arises when the host country decides to have domestic laws that actually attempt to promote social capital that are affected by the human right dimension of climate change. In the case of climate change displaced persons, there is a human rights dimension and an obligation under international law to provide adequate housing to a high standard. If there is going to be respect for that at all, there will need to be a domestic law to accommodate such persons, and in my view, and I hope I've convinced you the best uh, candidate is new urbanism. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie, for that very nice overview of uh, some of the challenges of resettlement. Our, our next speaker is Robin Bronin, who comes from uh, Anchorage to us. So she's a human rights attorney, the executive director of the Alaska Immigration Justice Project a PhD candidate in the Resilience and Adaptation Program at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and she studied resettlement in Papua New Guinea as well as in Alaska. Thank Probably. you. I'll let you do it. The next one, this one, yep. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be at this conference. I'm quite honored to be with you as a representative of the far north. And um, I'm going to continue with the theme of stories um, and the stories of what is happening in the Arctic to the indigenous communities that have inhabited the Arctic for millennia, where climate change is not something that is being predicted but is happening. It is also the story of adaptation and resilience. And for the communities in the Arctic that are being threatened by climate change, it is a story about relocation. And so um, in talking about this presentation, uh, what I want to do first is talk with you about how climate change is impacting the Arctic, and then talk specifically about the relocation of one community called New Talk. Um, and then, based on my experience of observing uh, their relocation for the last four years, um, the new governance framework, which must be based in human rights doctrine, 
which uh, needs to be implemented not only here in the United States, but I did go to Papua New Guinea in October to see the relevance of what's happening in the Arctic to the South Pacific, and it is very relevant. The, the similarities are unbelievable. And um, I came up with this word, climb migration, because I was really frustrated as an attorney who's represented refugees with the use of the words refugee. It is really inappropriate in this context. And so I created this word, um, and we'll talk with you about the definition, because the word has a definition. Um, and recently, the uh, UNFCCC has included in their long-term cooperative agreement planned relocations as one of the adaptation strategies to climate change. And it is imperative that relocations happen based in human rights doctrine. There is no human rights protocol that currently exists to talk about community-led relocations. And so I'm hoping that this experience in the Arctic will transform the way that we think about relocations if relocation is the only adaptation strategy to respond to climate change. Uh, let's see. So climate change in Alaska. Um, we are currently experiencing a 3.5 degrees Celsius increase during our winter time, um, which has led to pretty dramatic changes in our marine and terrestrial ecosystem. Permafrost is thawing, and the most tangible um, uh, evidence of climate change, when I went back to graduate school in 2007, I went to my first environmental conference, and at that conference, climate scientists were saying that the Arctic sea ice would no longer exist during the summertime by 2100 and at the earliest by 2050. Um, for those of you who are familiar with client, climate science, they are now saying that it's probably going to be in 2016 that the Arctic sea ice will no longer exist. That is dramatic. And I'll just share another story. Um, the, Alaska is mostly roadless, um, so even though we have this very large land mass, most of the indigenous communities are only accessible by air. And the northernmost indigenous community is a community called Barrow, Alaska, where Inupiaq live, um, and it is primarily an Inupiaq community. And two years ago, during the summertime, they noticed a group of German tourists wandering around town who had not arrived by air, they had arrived by boat through the Northwest Passage. Um, and so it is just an example of how quickly climate change is happening and, um, and why what's happening in Alaska is so relevant to the rest of the world. Um, so in regard to the community relocations, and the U.S. government has actually done a number of reports to document what is happening, although there has been very little action. And so in 2003, uh, the U.S. government issued a report which found that um, three communities needed to relocate in Alaska and 184 were affected by flooding and erosion. They did the re-report again in 2009 because there was so little being done to relocate communities um, that wanted to be relocated. And they found that that number had quadrupled to, to 12. And the number of communities that need to be relocated because of climate change is actually unknown because we're still trying to get all the data uh, collaborated um, in regard to flooding and erosion and with the permafrost thawing to understand really which communities are going to be able to be protected in place and which need to relocate. So uh, I just thought I would show you a map of our state, uh, the state of Alaska. If you can see that dark uh, line, that's the, those are the only roads in Alaska. And there are 200 indigenous communities that live off the road system, all of whom are on navigable waters, either rivers or on the Bering or Chukchi Sea, because people primarily have subsistence lifestyles. There's very little cash economy in these communities, and maintaining a subsistence lifestyle is really critical. 
So as I mentioned, the community of New Talk is the community that I have most uh, been most closely working with because despite those reports of documenting that these communities need to relocate, New Talk is the only community that has actually been able to be in a relocation process. And I have learned a tremendous amount from watching them, the traditional, the New Talk Traditional Council, orchestrate their relocation. So what's happening in New Talk? New Talk has uh, been experiencing a social ecological crisis, which they have been documenting since 1983. Um, they have had, they had six extreme weather events in between 1989 and 2006. Um, the government did try to protect them and spent well over a million dollars to try to control the erosion and flooding, and it was unsuccessful. I'll also share with you, because uh, folks mentioned yesterday, the, uh, the community of Kivalina. In Kivalina, which also needs to relocate, um, they uh, had a seawall put in place to protect their community in 2006 at a cost of several million dollars. On the day of the dedication ceremony, a storm came in and destroyed 180 feet of their 1,600-foot six, seawall, and a year later, the community needed to relocate or evacuate. Sorry, they are not in a relocation process. They needed to evacuate to be safe. The, uh, the New Talk Traditional Council, as I mentioned, uh, has been extraordinarily proactive, um, and they are, for me, the epitome of resilience in the face of unimaginable threats. And so, as I mentioned, they've documented the erosion since 1983 by hiring outside consultants um, who have been engineers to actually look at the erosion, document what's happening, and then to make predictions about how quickly the erosion is going to consume their community. They identified six potential relocation sites. So I know, you know, you saw that map of Alaska. There's a huge land area. Clearly, we have different land issues, um, meaning that people potentially will be able to go to land that's uninhabited. And that's why going to Papua New Guinea was so interesting because, as Brad mentioned, what Tulele Pesa is doing is they are going to Bougainville Island, which is inhabited and working with host communities so that their relocation is of benefit to those host communities. But in New Talk, they were able to look at six potential relocation sites. They actually hired a lobbyist and went to U.S. Congress to, uh, who authorized a land exchange between the traditional council of New Talk and the federal government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And the, here's the critical piece, um, which I think we need to put in this equation, is the community voted to relocate. So nobody is making the decision except for the community that they needed to relocate because they understood that they were threatened. They believed that there was nothing, no technological fix that was going to keep them safe. And so it's based on these factors that the community is actually uh, in a relocation process. And the relocation has been extraordinarily challenging. The first time that I uh, came upon this was, uh, again, in 2007 in an environmental conference, and there were 25 panelists, five representatives of the traditional council who all spoke of this crisis in their community, and then 20 representatives from pretty high levels in state and federal government. And those 20 representatives said, yep, they're in crisis and we have no idea how to relocate a community. And despite that, uh, the state with the traditional council has formed this ad hoc working group called the New Talk Planning Group, where there are 25 different federal, state, tribal agencies working to relocate the community. There's no mandate, no funding, and despite that, they are relocating. They also have had no technical or organizational capacity to facilitate the relocation, and there have been enormous statutory barriers. So uh, getting back to my, my, this word that I've created, climb migration, 
um, which is specifically about permanent community relocation doing, due to ongoing ecological change. The speaker yesterday talked about extreme weather events. Based on what's happening in Alaska, it is going to be the combination of extreme weather events with these ongoing processes, um, which are going to become accelerated and be the problem. So the extreme weather event will come and go, but it's those gradual processes which will become accelerated and threaten lives. And here's the other critical piece is that it's going to damage or destroy repeatedly the infrastructure needed for those communities. So the, the concept that I have based on all this work that I've done is creating this new adaptive governance framework which must be based in human rights doctrine. And the overall framework is a relocation policy framework, not that relocation must happen, but that people, if certain things happen, that relocation may be the only thing to protect communities. It's got to include uh, disaster relief and hazard mitigation, which is already happening in all parts of the world as we see these disasters with floods happening on a pretty frequent basis. And then it's got to include, obviously, the community voice. Communities have to be involved in the process along with the technical expertise to rebuild build or expand infrastructure um, and to provide that uh, technical expertise in regard to protecting communities. Um, the relocation policy framework, a lot of folks look to the guiding principles on internal displacement as potentially because this is a model based on internal displacement, but the guiding principles have no place for collective rights and also they are dealing with emergencies and this needs to be a planned relocation in order for people's human rights to be protected and the only way to incorporate the things that you were talking about housing is to have people make those decisions decision and it be part of human rights doctrine that the communities who are being relocated decide how it is they're relocated, where they're relocated to, obviously in cooperation with host communities, and then the process because relocating a group of people, whether it's 300, which is the size of the communities in Alaska, or 2,000 in the Carteret Islands, not everybody is going to relocate at one time. And so the communities themselves need to be deciding how it is that they relocate. Um, and so again, uh, disaster relief needs to be part of it, um, but disaster relief will only work so far, right? Because the whole disaster relief framework is you rebuild and return. Um, and so infrastructure is rebuilt with the possibility that it's going to be damaged. And in my research here in the United States, uh, the laws that govern disaster, disaster relief have been an enormous barrier to the relocation effort for two primary reasons. One, we have a very static definition of what a disaster is. Erosion is not part of it. So even though the erosion is what's threatening the communities, people can't get access to the funding for disaster relief for erosion. And then the laws that govern in the United States, again, the funding for disasters are not available if you're relocating an entire community. So if you want to rebuild that infrastructure in the same place where it's damaged or destroyed or in the same vicinity of a disaster area, you can. But if you're going to a new community that's, uh, in this case, New Talk is moving nine miles away, um, there is no mechanism to release that funding for that infrastructure at the relocation site. Um, and so in this, uh, what I call this dynamic adaptive governance process, communities need to decide with government um, and climate scientists these, what I call these social ecological indicators so that, in, so in Alaska we're in crisis. Uh, these communities are, are relocating in crisis um, and there needs to be the possibility of averting crisis so that there's more control about how that relocation happens. And so these are some of the ecological, social ecological signals that are relevant in Alaska and it's the repetitive loss of structure. There 
is no ability to protect the community in place. Um, the social economic indicators in New Talk, for instance, because of their limited access to potable water, there are huge health crises that are happening now with children um, and, uh, and illnesses that are caused because of their inability to get access to fresh water. Um, and so with climate migration, the, the other principle and why the UN Convention relating to, to refugees is not appropriate is that convention is based on this breaking of the bonds between a nation state government and their citizenry. And as the Republic of the Marshall Islands are here um, and the Maldives, people want to protect their citizenry. And so what the international community needs to do is foster the capacity building building for that protection to take place. Um, and then what needs to happen is there needs to be what these micro level social ecological assessments of what's happening in particular communities. The macro level stuff honestly does not work. And that's the thing that those are the sorts of things that Alaska is grappling with because we've got macro level information that really has limited relevance to what's happening on the ground in these communities that are facing the threats from climate change. And so um, I want to like thank all the people who have shared with me their knowledge. Stanley, Tom, um, you know, a lot of this information is on the internet uh, in regard to new, new talks relocation. And Stanley, Tom is their tribal administrator. He is remarkable. Ursula Rakova uh, from Tulele Pesa is another remarkable woman who is uh, in the face of these enormous challenges trying to protect their communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Robin. Um, we have um, time for, for c comments and, and questions uh, now. Uh, so let's uh, open it up to the floor and, and uh, see what we can work out. Uh, thank you, Robin, uh, particularly for the talking about the micro level assessment. I would like to share my, some of my experience in the context of Bangladesh. First of all, uh, this session, I think, find out the issues and challenges. Next session is for the legal response. Prior to legal response, I think we have to analyze the challenges and issues. First of all, we have to find out or identify the climate-induced migration. Who are the climate-induced migrants? If we look at the existing factors, socio-economic and political development, due to these reasons, peoples are, peoples are displaced. In, in, in addition to that, environmental factors. Even environmental factors, some of the uh, factors involved with transboundary pollution. But if we cons can consider the micro level disaster, if we consider the macro level disaster, what is the macro level disaster? For example, Isla in 2009 in Bangladesh, it was a macro level disaster. It displaced uh, thousands of people. Still, people are living on the no, very bad something. So this is the macro level disaster. In this case, we need to resettlement. But if you look at the micro level disaster, for example, every year the intensity, sorry, the, the frequency of the uh, signals of the port signals, <coughs> three, four. The coastal fish, fisher folks don't go to the, don't go to, for fishing. So they are losing their traditional livelihoods. Due to losing their traditional livelihoods, they are migrating. So in that case, we need to relook at, rehabilitate, compensate, and also uh, for the adaptation, resilience building. These are the things. Then if you look at the sea level rise, due to sea level rise, saline, saline water intrusion, people are losing their uh, productivity, agriculture productivity, losing their traditional um, uh, livelihood and f facing the food security. So due to these reasons, sea level, they are also migrating. Initially, who is the responsible? Definitely go national government is responsible to deal with these factors. So my comments is, this is the big challenge for the national governments, particularly the poor countries like Bangladesh, to deal with these mig migrated people. Because we don't, we have lots of existing problems. It is quite 
uh, it's a burden for Bangladesh government. So if we can identify these people are displaced due to climate change, I mean the climate induced migration, then we have to talk about the responsibility, liability. I think next session would response, legal response to these issues. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you. And uh, yeah, please uh, identify yourself uh, for the audience. Sir Samir from NYU. Uh, it seems to me that we are all talking about the wars of yesterday. Uh, in 44th Street, next to the IRS Internal Revenue Service, there is a big clock that shows the national debt of the United States, and it updates it every minute or every second. I didn't hear of any ecological clock that ticks and tells us where are we going with that. Only uh, the, the reporter from Alaska said that the timetable of disaster has been changed. And let me take this and uh, apply it to Bangladesh and say, let's say that the, by the 2014, all the snow on Himalayas has melted. And by 2015, we has an earthquake that leads to a tsunami that covers Bangladesh with water, God forbid, with water. And there is no Bangladesh anymore with all the million people they are. We are talking about a situation, not of yesterday refugees that can come back to their countries afterwards if they want to or if they are forced to. We are talking about countries that won't exist anymore. There is no way to go back. So what are we going to do with it? In the future, what is the template that the, the humanity has to deal with these people that are displaced for action that any one of us is doing in his own small way to contribute to climate change? Okay. Um, Brad, do you want to answer that question? <laughs> Oh, this is an easy one. Um, <clears throat> look, it, it seems to me, first of all, um, clearly the, the threat posed to a country like Bangladesh is absolutely enormous. And in fact, much of what has been written about climate-induced displacement has focused on large, heavily populated countries such as Bangladesh. It hasn't focused as much on issues of small island nations. Now, there are... Obviously, there are, there are important legal ramifications here that are different. If we're going to talk about internal resettlement within a country such as Bangladesh, which does have uh, landmass, even if you know, we know that there are several areas that are particularly at risk, that is, that is particularly different from the situation of uh, island nations that may lose uh, their complete territory to the point at which, as we heard yesterday, it might be uninhabitable. I think there are, there are mechanisms that we can look at, but equally there has to be quite a lot of forward planning right now. And one thing that I didn't have um, an opportunity really to discuss is the idea of developing an international NGO coalition and trying to pull together these disparate voices that are coming at it from sort of the, the hard sciences that are coming at it from ecology, that are coming at it from human rights and uh, protection, um, in order to advance an agenda uh, for protection which is, which is effectively timetabled, which identifies opportunities that may exist, whether that's, for example, the purchasing of land now, uh, the developing of, of um, urban planning and uh, other sort of housing <coughs> options. Um, and equally, to, to start gathering data now in terms of what are the effects on an individual and, and human level. So, for example, gathering data on the, um, uh, the, the, the health risks that are associated with, with climate change, gathering data on the increase in, say, diarrheal disease among children under five. All of this is going to be really important in order to make a case and to, to advance advocacy.
Well, and I would say the adaptation strategies, I think we have very limited knowledge about all the adaptation that is happening on the local level, because it's when I've been reading about what's happening in different parts of the world, communities are extraordinarily innovative and creative, and what they need are funding and resources. Um, and I'm convinced that it, whatever happens has to happen at the local level, because it's those people, one, who are going to be affected, and who who know their environment better than anyone else. Ambassador Mueller. Thank you and good morning. <coughs> Thank you, uh, panel, for the uh, excellent presentation. <coughs> Let me uh, start off by saying that whenever we discuss the idea of relocation, this is a scary uh, concept. I think when we discuss the, the issue of relocation, first of all, we are giving an excuse for the emitters to continue to emit. And, and, and I, think, I think the focus of our conversation should be how do we stop the emitters from continuing to let the uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, continue to um, uh, cause the problem that we are discussing. I think this, I think this, is, this, is a, this should be the focus of our discussion. Um, having said that, let me just say that I think we need to, first of all, <clears throat> we need to make a distinction between um, an internal uh, migration versus international migration. In the case of the Cataract Islands, the people were being moved within a sovereign territory, which excuse me, <laughs> which uh, does not require uh, issues of governance and, and, and citizenship and all of that, because they're moving within that territory. For the Marshall Islands, we are talking about moving into an international uh, migration issue. And so it will require uh, much more uh, planning, and many more issues of governance, and the rights of the whole group to be moved to a new a new sovereign territory. So that's one, one issue. The other issue for the Marshall Islands is when we say that the people are part of the land, that they really do are part of the land. The, the people are, are identified in, within the clan, and we know where they are from based on the land that they own. And so they have the, they have the uh, um, freedom to go and harvest and to, to make their own living. Whereas if they move to an urban center or an urban community, I don't know how they would be able to do the same things that they're doing uh, in, in their own traditional uh, way of life. This would be completely different. So I think we need to take those uh, issues into consideration when we, when we discuss uh, uh, migration. But again, I come back to the point that I think we are missing the, the boat when we keep talking about migration. We should go after those guys who are causing the problem. I think that's what we should do. Thank you. Yes, and, and we, we do have examples, of course, as you know, of the Inuitak and Bikini people uh, having to be uh, relocated uh, during the uh, atomic testing, and it uh, caused enormous uh, mm -hmm cultural and, and human yes. problems uh, for them because there was no way of replicating the atolls that they um, knew and, and uh, traditionally were linked to, and so they had enormous suffering during, during that period. Yes, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, and thank you to the panelists. Um, it was said during the expose, uh, it was referred to human rights and uh, guarantee of human rights. And I think it is essential. But uh, you know, when you see what is happening at this moment in Lampedusa and all the parts of the world, it seems that uh, the guarantee of human rights come in second or third position in front of the will of the states or in front of the politic of the states. So human rights is fundamental, but I think that we should, uh, and we are going to talk about this uh, later, I think, it's uh, about um, uh, 
convention, a new a convention that give guarantees to these people who are relocated, to these my, uh, how, do you, how do you say that, climb migrants, to this climb. In French, it is uh, refugee climatic. I don't know how to, to, to match it with your word, but refugee climatic is very, in French, is very precise also, but it is refugee. Uh, so the climb migrant, we have to have um, a kind of convention to guarantee their relocation in the framework of human rights. Because uh, if we don't do that, not only these migrants, these climate, climate migrants, have been, um, have been victim of uh, the situation they couldn't control because they are not emitters, so they are victims of the emitters, first of all, and after they are victims of those who don't want to, to uh, accept them in their countries. So it is a situation I think that we should also, as we are going to, to see this new international convention, to give guarantee to these refugees. And I would like to, to, be, um, uh, to be confirmed about the numbers. It seems that at this moment there is already uh, 250,000 uh, refugee climatic in the world. I don't know where they, they bring that, but climatic refugee, not uh, from conflicts, etc. So I would like to, to be confirmed on that. And uh, I think that uh, we should, uh, during this discussion on new international convention, see how it is possible to have guarantees for these crime migrants, for them not to suffer twice in their world, in their uh, life. Or, or in their non-life, because it is a non-life to be relocated. You don't have any more your culture. You can practice, practice your, uh, what, you, what is the significance of your life? So uh, this is what I wanted to, to say on this, because we talked about the guarantee of human rights. And at this moment, we cannot just believe that human rights are, are going to be guaranteed to these people. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me, let me call on Foreign Minister Silk uh, to speak next. Uh, thank you, Professor, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, panel, uh, for the presentations. And uh, let me first uh, say that I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I could see you up there, Professor Van Tyck. I, uh, I know that you have been uh, associated with some work in the Marshall Islands in the past. Uh, following up to the comments by Ambassador Mueller, and, uh, and, and in particular in reference to uh, Professor uh, Stein's uh, presentation on the, what is called the new urbanism. Um, I, I wish you had gone further and, and to explain how if, the, let's say, the people of the Marshalls were evacuated and uh, to, I don't know what country uh, that would be willing to take them, but it, assuming that they were evacu evacuated to, to, to uh, the United States and under this new urbanism uh, scheme, the question is, I ask that is, how, how would, what kind of relationship this community would have with the host government, with the host nation? I think that's part of the issue that uh, Ambassador Mueller brought up. Uh, I, there are other points that I would like to bring up, but I, first I'd like to specifically address that issue uh, with you there. Thank you. <clears throat> I must say that I'm a, uh, not a firm believer, as great as it sounds, in human rights declarations, because in many ways they have the consequence of being interpreted differently by different people and also ignored in certain cases. It's like a guarantee of particular human right doesn't necessarily get you a result. Depends on its interpretation. So I'm looking at it from a just on the ground point of view. The situation would be that urban, there, there is some new urbanism in a sense in uh, tight urban centers, but primarily its function is in respect of new greenfield sites. Uh, 
And there would have to be sites which would, according to my work, have to be funded externally, not by developers, but by funded by community development block grants given by HUD for the purpose of setting aside areas in which these people can voluntarily go if they want to because housing is available. And research has shown when public housing is available, those people who are migrating to a country will take advantage of it. So the idea would be in greenfield sites. The relationship would not be determined by the uh, planning consequence. In other words, a neighborhood would be set up. Each neighborhood said to have a 100-year cycle. So therefore, would have to also comply with local laws. The idea would be that it would be established on the ground, made to actually be attractive to those who would come, could never possibly replicate the exact relationship between an individual and land, when in fact that occurs as a, as a, in terms of tenure systems, but nevertheless, to the best that's possible on local law, would approximate that in terms of giving people land to use, making common land available and the like. Um, so the idea of actually setting up a community would at least, in fact, be the only way in which these human rights dimensions would be activated on a practical basis rather than be lofty statements or conventions and the like. We all despair at the result of conventions on climate change. Why would we not despair at the end of the day on conventions on human rights for those displaced by climate change? But this at least puts it on the ground and says this is the way, in fact, uh, the community should look, function, and has gone through a particular process and fit within the domestic laws of the host country, such as the U.S. So I'm not sure if that's a direct answer to your question, but... Uh, Alex DeSherman and was season at Columbia University. Uh, my question is directed to Robin, and I thought it was a really provoking, um, thought-provoking presentation. But one of the issues um, that you brought up was the fact that U.S. law is not really geared towards uh, reconstruction or relocation of communities outside of areas. After Katrina, obviously, there were people who were talking about the fact that rebuilding New Orleans bigger and better was not necessarily the best response, given the likelihood that either sea level rise or increased flood risk, which we've seen recently, might actually continue to endanger the, the city. So I'm just wondering, what are the prospects for changing U.S. policy in that regard? Or are you aware of any efforts to uh, actually be able to fund communities that say, okay, uh, we need to relocate because it's no longer possible for us to reside where we, we've traditionally uh, been living? Uh, thank you for your comment. And I, I the... Um there is no effort on a national level to create what I would call a relocation policy framework. But given the enormity of what's happening in Alaska, for instance, our congressional delegation is very well aware um, of what's happening. And they're looking at new talks relocation as kind of like the model to figure out what needs to happen. Um, in regard to the human rights protocol, I think that that is essential um, that whatever is created that there are, it, that it is based in human rights because one of the things that for instance the state of Alaska and the US federal government was looking at in regard to the indigenous communities that are um, anywhere between three and six hundred people is initially they were looking at relocating them to what we call hub communities, to communities that were more urban. And that's what propelled the communities themselves to say, we are not opting for this. We're going to stay in place until we come up with our own solution. Um, and so my hope is, is by spreading the word of what's happening in Alaska, that we do come up with a relocation policy framework, because clearly I watch what's happening along the Mississippi. Uh, in New Orleans and the, the issues that like the Marshall Islanders and the, the in, in, Inupiaq and Yupik are facing in regard to this intense connection with the land is, is for lots of people and, and why it needs to be a community level conversation and community guided and directed if relocation really is the only option available. I want to just to get back for a moment to Ambassador Mueller's uh, co comment that uh, we want to, you know, stop the emissions rather than focus on, on 
resettlement. But I, I guess uh, if I understood what we heard yesterday, I, I mean, it's too late uh, that the sea level will rise uh, one to two meters, if, even if we do no more emitting at the present time, so that we, we can't uh, avoid this issue altogether. And I, I wondered if I could call on David Freestone for a moment to, to talk about the, the, the World Bank experience. If, uh, I mean, uh, when the bank funds uh, a, a dam or something causing resettlement, I mean, what, what are the, the bank's uh, standards that uh, are imposed as part of that uh, project? All right. Yes, I'm uh, happy to do that. And, and you know, just to make this point about that graph that I showed, which shows, you know, historical levels of sea level rise, I think that we're, with the commitments that we have, we're looking at over p past two, 2,100, we're looking at a lot more than two meters. I mean, it will continue even if we are able to bring it under control. Now, the World Bank has a policy on, I used to be the Deputy General Counsel of the World Bank, the, 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 the issue of resettlement is highly controversial. Uh, and over many years, the banks developed uh, a policy on involuntary resettlement, uh, which is only, uh, policy says it should only happen as the absolute last resort after a long process of assessment, etc. Uh, and there are provisions for pr very strong protection for provisions of livelihoods that must be at least the equivalent status of, uh, in terms of economic uh, um, uh, income for the people that are maintained and, and the aspiration is they should be substantially higher. I mean, that causes a lot of problems in some, some uh, what we could call, uh, uh, what uh, Antonio tells us we shouldn't call developing countries, but uh, under consume no, consuming uh, uh, countries, not, not over-consuming countries. But it causes a lot of problems in countries because sometimes we're talking about people being relocated and uh, to with income levels which are higher than the people that they're being relocated amongst. So it's highly controversial, but there is a, there is a framework for doing that. Uh, but the experience, I think, of some of these, these big projects is that, that it's even with these safeguards, which have, with the, um, I know that Siobhan McNerney is going to be talking about human rights later, and she's one of the bank's experts on human rights. I think that, although the, the, the phrase human rights doesn't actually appear in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the policy that actually all the respect for, for individual cultures and individuals are, are, are uh, in, included in that policy. But it, having said that, it's extremely difficult. Uh, and the pol to be avoided, that's the basic uh, premise of this policy, is it should avoid it in, uh, unless it's absolutely inevitable. So, so it's, been a, it's been a kind of tough policy to, to implement. The group that, that I used to manage had to sort of oversee it. It's very, very difficult, and there haven't been any cases I'm aware of where it's been where it goes goes smoothly. Or, so, you know, this is not an easy easy issue to do. But, but if the uh, resettlement is a, is a necessary element of the the project, uh, there is full compensation to the people that have to resettle. Absolutely. So they're guaranteed that their their livelihoods will be at least what they were before they left, and they should be more. So that that's actually part of the policy. Well, and so, and what I would say, because I am familiar with those guidelines, but the really big distinction is that the communities aren't making that decision to relocate. A government is coming in and saying you need to relocate to build this infrastructure, which is why what is happening in Alaska and in Papua New Guinea is so unique, because the community themselves is saying we need to relocate and we're going to guide this entire process which will include those guidelines that are in the World Bank, but it's reframing it from the community level that, you know, we don't know because the relocations haven't yet occurred to document that the community actually is better off because they've left this place that has been threatening their lives because of climate change. Yes, sir, in the back. Could, can you, you have to press the red button, sorry. I'm Mustafa Nasser from University of Chittong, Bangladesh, and now doing PhD on climate change displacement in Bangladesh at Macquarie University, Australia. So thank you, Robin, for uh, discussing the relocation strategies for uh, Alaska based on human rights doctrine. And then I was wondering, actually, the possible relocation measures in uh, Bangladesh. And before that, I'd like to share some facts uh, about Bangladesh. Um, uh, climate change is not uh, actually a prediction for Bangladesh. It's, uh, it's happening in Bangladesh. And every year, almost 500,000 people are moving to capital city from coastal areas. And uh, they are victims of climate change uh, due to salinity and salinity intrusion and other um, environmental degradations. They are moving to 
uh, capital city and other cities and they are living in slums and almost 40 percent of the population in capital city uh, live in slums uh, uh, in Dhaka and so the Bangladesh is a small uh, state small country and one of the uh, least developed countries and uh, the current population is 160 million and by 2020 it's going to be uh, 200 million and <laughs> only one, uh, 144,000 kilometers is the total area. So in this context, actually, uh, I was wondering the relocation measures, how we can uh, ensure the, the proper relocation measures for the displaced people. It's uh, predicted that 20 to 30 million people will be displaced by 2050. So we don't have a spare land like uh, Papua New Guinea. They, were, uh, they could be relocated from Carteret to Bogan Valley. But in Bangladesh, there is no spare land for human settlement. We destroyed our forest. We destroyed our rivers. Even we, we started settlement in rivers. We are encroaching rivers. And we destroyed our agricultural land for human settlement. So actually, I was wondering how people could be relocated in this context. It's so densely populated. Obviously, I'm not saying that international community, there is a question of responsibility is responsible for this. We are also equally responsible. We fail to control our birth rate, and we fail to ensure good governance and other uh, possible measures. Obviously, national government is responsible. But how the national government uh, have the lack of capacity and lack of financial resources to deal with it? And about the human rights uh, norms and uh, principles, uh, I guess uh, now in capital city, the, the average uh, living is, uh, people is living more than three to 4,000 people living in a one kilometer. And if in future, more people rush to capital city, so there are uh, almost seven to eight thousand people will live in a single kilometer. So I think it itself a uh, human rights violation to live <laughs> such a big number of people within a small place, and it, it is impossible to ensure human rights protection for this large number of people. Uh, still, now uh, Bangladesh government cannot generate uh, electricity and energy for all the people. Only 20 to 30 percent people gets the energy and the electricity, and housing and right to food all are big challenge. So I like your uh, thinking about the relocation measures in this context, uh, relocation measures in the uh, large population and densely uh, populated country. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And that's a really complex question that I don't have the answer to, to all the elements of it, because part of what you're talking about are development issues that have nothing to do with climate change and have to do with poverty. And what we know is that climate change is going to exacerbate the living conditions of people all over the world who are currently poor not of any consequence because of climate change. But one of the things that you said is that people right now, 500,000 people are relocating to the capital city of Bangladesh. And so what I would say is, you know, at some government level, there needs to be more planning involved in how those people are relocated and maybe taking in some of the concepts that Professor Stein was talking about of new urban, there needs to be planning. This is, you know, planned relocations can happen. I mean, they are happening in Alaska. And I believe if they're done with the communities making the, dis like the fundamental decisions of how that happens with technical assistance from the national government or state government, then it's possible for some people, if you're talking 500,000 people annually, that's a lot of people who are already making that decision to find a place to live. Brad? Um, can, can I just come back? My, my understanding is that most of the internal migration in Bangladesh is not happening as a result of environmental factors. Um, people have been migrating traditionally in Bangladesh. They migrated along sort of the riverbanks and deltas, as they have done. But that this, this is very much a development issue. And that um, we need to, again, we need to have a better understanding of why it is that people are migrating. So far, there have been very, very few successful efforts that have curbed the flow of migration to um, two cities and, and what's happening in Dhaka is not wildly different from what we see in other uh, parts of S South Asia and Southeast Asia where we're, we're seeing the development of these megacities. 
But there are some examples that one can point to. For example, in India, the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Guarantee Act, which has been used as a way of trying to offer incentives for people to stay in rural areas by creating, trying to create job opportunities by offering sort of public works programs to try to slow the rate of migration to, to the cities. There's then the secondary question of conditions within the cities because we know that people are more vulnerable, um, that poor people are more vulnerable, they're more vulnerable to the effects of, uh, of climate change, uh, flooding, etc. Um, in part because of the ways in which cities are planned, uh, because of uh, problems with respect to infrastructure, drainage, and the like. And that is something that governments can, can look at, and certainly with the assistance of uh, multilateral agencies. Um, I just wanted to come back on one point with respect to the sort of involuntary uh, resettlement and relocation that we've seen in, again, in, in a number of uh, Asian uh, contexts where people have been moved out as a result of large infrastructure development projects. And in spite of the, the, sort of the, the, the guarantees that have, been, that have been put in place, what we have found, certainly if you look at massive, massive projects like the Three Gorges Dam, you find that um, there has not been uh, an adequate substitution of livelihoods. And in other contexts, for example, in Vietnam, where people have been moved from, say, traditional fishing to shrimp, shrimp cultivation, that has had a significant knock-on effect in terms of the, uh, well, the, the ecological consequences of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of maritime resources. So that is something we need to look at equally. There are issues around pollution. It is very, very difficult to relocate people en masse in a way in which is sustainable, which respects human rights, and is in any way uh, livelihood enhancing. If anything, the evidence seems to suggest it isn't. Hi, Tina Stegi from the Marshall Islands. And this is actually a question for Les Stein. Um, so in the Marshall Islands, we've heard a little bit about the uh, land rights regime there, which is very specific and unique uh, and essentially communal. Uh, and I'm interested, because I think when I heard when you were talking about new urbanism that whatever community was set up would have to correspond or at least follow domestic law, let's say, if it was in the U.S. And I'm wondering how flexible is that new urbanism concept in incorporating something which is not, um, I'm not sure that that land holding re regime that exists in the Marshalls could translate or correspond with U.S. local laws. How does that work? Well, Thank the you. actual um, sentiment in respect to the land and the personal relationship with respect to the land um, might not be um, as reflected as it is in the Marshall Islands. However, there are various devices that exist in terms of holding land in common, um, in a sense what are called homeowner associations, which in fact could uh, replicate to some degree. <clears throat> The idea is that uh, there has to be some bridge between what currently exists and if there is resettlement, what should exist. And all of those things have to be teased out and brought into the fore and tested by various scenarios, as happened in Haiti. The idea in Haiti was that there was a need for communal land and if, therefore everything was built uh, for protection as well, so it was like a bunch of wagons around a, a common area with the agricultural land coming off from that. Haitians having also a relationship in terms of land tenure, which is different to that enjoyed in the U.S. So I'm optimistic that the legal devices that exist, such as in the U.S. and Canada, could accommodate the land tenure arrangements to a high degree that exist in places like the Marshall Islands and elsewhere. It's been found, for instance, that um, uh, in terms of Australia, where the Aboriginal relationship to land is the, the critical basis of their dreaming and the future of the, of the whole Aboriginal culture, that that, in fact, can, to some degree, be accommodated by land which is set up for their, their use. Thank you. 
again, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, but I think there's a high degree of approximation, and the tools do exist. Okay, so why don't we take the remaining comments, and then we'll have the panelists uh, give a final comments. So we have, I'm seeing about three, three or four hands here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Stephen Cass, Brooklyn Law School. Um, I think Robin's comments um, about the importance and the difficulty uh, still of of effective relocation for small communities of several hundred people, after all. And this gentleman's comments about the even greater challenges of, of accommodating a potential relocation of 31 million people in Bangladesh, both emphasize the real difficulty that local governments, state governments, national governments, are going to have, even in the United States, to address these kinds of issues. And in countries with much um, reduced resources, it'll become impossible for local governments to affect the kind of relocation and, uh, that's being discussed. While I understand that the um, purpose of this conference is not really to talk about how we're going to mitigate emissions, but instead how we're going to deal with adaptation, and I think it's great, there is, there is a question of the international community's responsibility to fund these things, because I don't really think there are very many governments that can afford to do so by themselves. So I would hope that built into any kind of a, a uh, serious adaptation strategy and relocation strategy is, is um, a source of funding, whether it's through international uh, financial transaction taxes, international trade taxes, or something else that can be counted on because absent a guaranteed flow of money uh, from the emitting world, if, if I may call it that, um, these programs are not going to be implementable. Yes, way in the back. Thanks very much, uh, Siobhan McInerney for the World Bank. Um, my question is to uh, Brad Blitz. You made a really interesting point in conclusion about uh, perhaps relying um, less on a rights-based foundation, uh, I guess for protection, but I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that, and you mentioned uh, communitarian foundations, international hum uh, humanitarian law. Um, and I'm just curious as to whether that uh, protection would uh, be disconnected in some way from existing public international law or the law at all. Uh, so just if you could talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Okay, but before we get to that, let's take a few more comments on the floor. Yes. Well, thank you. I'm Carolina Claro with the University of Sao Paulo. Well, uh, in one hand, I believe we should bear in mind that many people don't wish to migrate, either in internally or internationally. And on the other hand, uh, We've been facing a migratory crisis in, triggered by 9-11 events and the economic crisis in which states are even uh, more reluctant to receive temporary or permanent immigrants. So I wonder which uh, countries would be willing to resettle climate-induced Im immigrants, especially coming from these small island states and flat, flat coastal regions, uh, when global migration governance is scarce and lacks all kinds of coordination between its actors, and not to mention how these immigrants would be, would be treated inside the receiving states. Thank you. See, there was another hand back here, yes? Hi, Courtney Brown, the Asia Foundation. I actually want to follow up on this gentleman's question here about how to fund um, this sort of type of migration. I was wondering if uh, under the UNF, um, Triple C and the Global Environmental Facility, when people are discussing NAPAs, nationally, uh, National Adaptation Plans of Action, and NAMAs, Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Action, if anything has come up to secure funding from those mechanisms that exist already to support the relocation and be proactive about it. So I was wondering through any of your research if you've come across using NAPAs and NAMAs in the Global Environmental Facility to fund this sort of relocation projects. Thank you. Any other comments on the floor before we turn it over to the panelists? Uh, yes, sir. Little question. Uh, my friend Nasser said that Bangladesh government is not capable enough to deal with this looming crisis. Then who will take the responsibility? Polluting countries? Thanks. Okay, well, um, let's. Uh,
have our panelists, maybe in reverse order. Uh, why don't you start, uh, Robin, and see if you can answer some of these questions. So I'm going to talk about the funding piece because that has been a critical issue uh, in Alaska, even though we are part of the United States, um, and why this adaptive governance framework that's based in disaster relief, because look at all the millions of dollars that's raised to respond to disasters. And we need to figure out when using those funds to rebuild and repair in place is no longer a viable option, obviously before the next disaster happens, and create a relocation of policy framework to start using those funds that are generated in response to a disaster to create a relocation process for the communities who have been affected by the disaster. And I haven't looked at NAPA's to, to see whether that would be another viable option. But clearly, you know, the capacity building for nation state governments in regard to technology and funding are critical and already part of the UNFCCC, and this needs to be part of that process. Since planned relocations are now part of the long-term, at least the draft text, the long-term cooperative agreement. Thank you. Okay, uh, Les, and, and maybe just to proceed, uh, uh, Robin emphasized the importance of human rights in, in all these uh, resettlements, and you suggested that you're not such a fan of human rights declarations, and I wondered if you could uh, clarify exactly what what your thought is about uh, this issue. a terrible thing to say about anyone, really. <clears throat> but there, there are two things. The first one is, coincidentally, I've just been looking for another project for Professor Gerard about the whole question of whether or not or the degree of funding for least developed nations in terms of NAPIS, um, and look through all of the reports that have come in through the, uh, I think there's 17 reports for the least developed uh, nations in the fund, only to find that absolutely no money has been allocated to resettlement issues. All of it's been allocated thus far, essentially, to the preparation of the national strategies. So that was one of the questions that were asked. Now, of course, I, I um, returning to the question of human rights, um, what we all have is the continued feeling that things are getting too late, but yet we somehow block it out of our mind and, and think that something will, in fact, be done, when we all know regularly that absolutely nothing's being done. And we've had early statements about the fact that what you can perceive is that the lack of action more than the uh, taking of action in terms of mitigation. So it seems to me that in many ways um, the action that has taken place in terms of adaptation has been mainly by regional and local initiatives um, in terms of existing laws which can be turned to the purpose of adaptation or to mitigation. And that land use is in fact not only a fantastic tool for mitigation, because there's an existing structure, but more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, it can be turned to this question of adaptation. However, I, human rights, uh, I'd love to actually hear that there's a convention, but we already have uh, COP and we already have uh, UN uh, Human Rights Commission making statements about urban settlements. But basically, nothing has come out of that, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the delay that's occurred and the crisis that we face now. So I believe that the emphasis must be on uh, nations which are threatened to actually develop for themselves those indices of exactly what it is they need if, in fact, the time comes when they have to um, and we wish, we don't wish any of us that it ever happens, a time comes when they actually have to move. What is it they need to say to a host country about what they need if, in fact, a host country is willing to accept them? What does it look like on the ground? What would a community actually be like? I think that's a much more important issue at the moment than having a human rights convention which guarantees every person who's going to be resettled some effective housing when, in fact, you finally get to the line and nobody knows what that effective housing would actually look like. So that's the point of view that I have. Hey, um, Brad, uh, I guess one of the questions that has been raised that nobody's really answered is where are these people going to go and um, what, what countries realistically are going to take them? I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts about what, what, what we're going to be looking at in the future in terms of um, um, venues where people are going to be welcomed? 
Well, obviously this is highly speculative. Um, there are certain countries we know, some countries that have large land masses where there are declining populations. So, for example, the Russian Federation is actively seeking to resettle ethnic Russians who are in <coughs> Argentina and, and elsewhere, um, encouraging them to return. <coughs> it's far from ideal. I, I really don't know what are the countries that one could point to where there might be um, you know, sufficient space and, and resources. I think that this is going to be done on a much more narrowly defined sort of geopolitical basis um, in connection with uh, existing ties, uh, opportunities for uh, both labor migration. Um, and uh, I would suggest that it's, if resettlement is to be considered, it would most likely be either closer to home or via uh, the sort of countries that are more traditionally supportive of resettlements. And so there we're, we're talking about countries like the United States, Canada, hopefully you know, Australia and New Zealand as well in this, this context. But that, of course, shifts the burden onto uh, countries that are already um, taking in people. Um, could I just come back to uh, a point that was raised by a colleague, I believe, from, from the World Bank? And I, I held out at the, the, the very conclusion of my my talk, the idea of needing to find a way of somehow disaggregating um, individual from group rights as, as, as a way of moving towards a mechanism for protection. And uh, Maxine yesterday uh, put forward a very creative uh, offer, and, it, and she recognized that clearly we are tied into this sort of Westphalian state model. It's very hard to think beyond it or around it. And I was thinking that perhaps one way in which we could start to try to envision uh, a way forward might be, for example, to look at what the bank has done, but in a different context, where in order to try to build um, a stronger basis for national integration and, um, and regional security 10, 15 years ago, or 15 years ago, uh, the bank supported a number of cultural restoration projects in places, I, I believe, like Azerbaijan and places where they felt that the state was not, not sufficiently strong and there were um, potential uh, local and regional, regional risks. And so whether or not there are ways in which we can move towards protecting people by building a stronger um, communal base, um, by finding ways in which public spaces, whether, whether it's physically or through uh, symbolic modes, can be um, protected as, as a way of providing people some, some type of mooring. And I know that, for example, in the Carteret Islands, they've talked about potentially looking at land that has subsided as, as, as a site of heritage and fishing, and ag again, trying not to uh, allow the, the, the physical divorce from the land to, to feel so permanent. S Senator Momotar, one, one last comment before we have to break. Yeah, th thank you. Just want to thank the panelists for the very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to follow up on our ambassador's uh, comment regarding uh, that uh, our position is not relocation, but you know the stopping of emission gas, greenhouse gases. And if I heard it right, I think you mentioned that even though the greenhouse gases will be stopped, but still the sea, light, uh, sea, uh, sea water will will still rise. And I find it very, uh, this very uh, an inform information for us because we have to go back to our people and inform them what we came and learn in this, uh, this uh, conference. And not only that, but I find it very demoralizing to us. And I was just wondering, because you know we had the uh, they had the Copenhagen uh, meeting and they had the Copenhagen adaptation adaptation fund, and I understand you know the contribution from some of the bigger countries they have been been given if I'm right, and I'm just uh, trying to wonder if this also goes with the uh, with the fact that it was mentioned that even though greenhouse gas would be stopped but still the 
uh, see whether rice will still, you know, coming up and uh, submerge our islands. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, we've run out of time for this panel, but we have uh, more discussion time today and, and tomorrow. I want to thank uh, the three panelists uh, for excellent presentations and, and also the audience for their active questions.